Hey everybody, so I had to jump ahead a little bit to the live read today and move it to uh, an hour early because my son is napping and this is an easier time to do the reading when I'm not uh, unavailable to help my wife with him when he's awake. So we're going to do the live read of chapter one of The Shield and part of chapter two. And what I've decided to do uh, this time around, instead of trying to force my way through each chapter every time, I'm going to use the natural breaks that exist in the chapters as stopping points uh, when necessary. So with uh, previous live read of the sword, I would try to plow through an entire chapter or two if I started one. Now I think I'm just going to do uh, try to keep things under 45 minutes to an hour, um, and that way the episodes move along and have those natural stopping points that we're using. So. Uh, to recap, the previous section of the prologue uh, introduced uh, more of Trem's backstory when he was younger at the Force of Aves, and also introduced the conflict between uh, Alinormir, the goddess of life, and uh, Narath, the god of death. And that is relevant because at the end of the chapter with Trem's flashback, you find out that Vakhtin, the guy who is training him, uh, is an adherent of Narath's, but that they are not necessarily in agreement on how to go about accomplishing their goals uh, in, <clears throat> with the future of the world and the mortals in it, and that sort of thing. So, on to chapter one. The hunger toward him through the deafening darkness. His eyes flitted all around, seeking in the nothingness the means to satiate his dreaded lust. Reason fled from him, and he clawed at the stones until blood ran from his fingers, each time thrusting them into his maw in an impossible attempt to stave off his need. Constant howls and shrieks echoed through the cavernous halls and stairs of the tower, most coming from above, but some, the most bestial and unimaginable sounds, came impossibly from below. The prisoner tried to ignore them. There was only the need, the desperate unending need that never left him, and rent his mind and body asunder, as surely as whips upon his flesh. He roared in terrible frustration and threw himself against the walls and iron bars of the, back of the black cell, hoping to strike himself from consciousness for only a few moments to ease the suffering. He heard them then, footsteps on the nearest stairs, soft velvet boots, a quiet and deliberate padding, accompanied by a strange and rhythmic clicking and whirring like gears mixed with an aging clock that kept time precisely but audibly. With a monumental effort, the captive held his rage in check and crouched quietly, straining for any sight of the fiend he knew was coming. As the faint tread neared him, the steady claptrap remained, the motions of his captor now visible in the weak light of a glowing orb hovering over one shoulder. It was the warden of this tower prison. His alien, almost musical accompaniment could not have belonged to any other. Without realizing it, the prisoner had burrowed against the back stones of the cell, watching them from afar, watching from afar, as he, as he did. The figure just stopped just short of the cell's bars, unmoving and silent. The magical orb, surrounded in wisps of faint smoke, whirred from one side of the cloaked form to the other. Within his confines, the captain felt his rage build to an unbearable height, his anger overflowing, though he tried to contain it, knowing he must try to keep his distance, even as he wished to strike. The strain was such that he began to shake uncontrollably, quivering with the desire to do harm. The orb paused in the circumvention of this mad host, revealing a terrible mask of wires and crystal, with dead eyes glowing faintly above it. Are you hungry, my dear child? Rage crashed in waves within the prisoner, but he held back. He managed to croak out, I'm not your child, sorcerer. Gentle laughter met his defiance. The ticking of machinery slowed and stuttered a moment, and one hand stole to the figure's left ribs, and there was a sound of twisting and tightening of metal before the rhythm resumed. In that brief moment, it seemed the warden of this dark place jerked and hitched in his movement, but the captive could not be certain. The dark presence whispered enticingly, Your journey has only just begun. You have no idea what wonders await you, and you will not forget when we are through that you are my child. I have made you. You will be grateful to me, always, as you should be now, for I have brought you something to ease your pain. A force impossibly strong but painless took hold of the captive and pressed him back against the walls of his prison. The suffering prisoner tried to fight back, but was all for naught. The devil that had brought him to this black place had him pinned with his magic. The captive snarled and spat into the unending blackness, unsure if he hit his mark. The cell door swung slowly open, and the warden stepped inward. The faint light of his orb now showed that he was not alone. He bore a small child in his arms, his, her face wan and sickly, but her eyes were alight with horror and understanding as the sweat soaking her clothes reeked of fear. The captive cried out as if struck and pressed his face against the stone of the cell, almost as if to grind his flesh into it as he wailed, No, I said no more, no more living, no more. The captor deposited the unmoving parcel in the center of the cell. 
She will not fight. I have seen to that. But you must grow to accept your fate. She's not of your ilk, Azariel. You are only the only one of your kind, and likely shall be forever. It is time to embrace your destiny, to be the predator among the prey. With that, the dread captor turned and strode from the room, the cell door shutting behind him as the invisible bonds on his captive winked out. Falling to the floor on his hands and knees, the prisoner sobbed, mingling with the soft, choking cries of the child. He fought as long as he could, resisted his need, his desire, but it was like fighting the crashing waves of the sea when he was merely a speck of sand. It overwhelmed him, washed over him, and his vision blurred as the hunger started to envelop his mind. The blood pulsed through the child before him, and it hammered in his ears until he could hear nothing else. Only then, when the need and the pounding of his ears drowned out the slowly emerging cries of his victim, did he give in and feast, drenched in the blood of innocence as he spiraled from denial of his nature into true damnation. <clears throat> Nepal City was never quiet. In the deepest hours of the night, there were still crashes of debris and refuse flung from high windows, or the calls of the less reputable sellers in dark alleys attempting to lure customers into the shadows to peruse their various wares, best not sold in the light of day. Sometimes those ventures into the dark came with the sound of a blade biting in the flesh, the cries of the injured and dying, or the splatter of blood on cobblestones. It seemed such ills had never been so prevalent in the city as they were now. Many had thought that when the new high thane, Frothgar Conan, had been sent south to command the armies in the Dust Plains, his raging horde of cutthroat spies and smugglers would calm down, but a darker presence had taken his position as the power in Nepal City. Kermon Arafos, of the line of Nepal that had been long shunned by his fellow northern houses, now reigned in the capital. Wolfbane might be the commander of the invading forces, but the scope of his duties and righteous calling was such that matters in Nepal City troubled him rarely. To Kermon Arafos, Thane of House Arafos and Lord of Shearwater Cove, the rule of the capital had fallen. As such, the knights had become fraught with peril, and Thane Arafos's personal house carols had done little to mitigate the illegal trade of prostitution and mysterious substances that were growing in the city. Indeed, they seemed to have taken up positions of power among the most prominent dens of sin, protecting the drug runners and masters of the men and women of the night for a small profit. Kermon Arafos would have set the whole place alight if he had been able. His family's house had once tried to rise from nothing to be on equal footing with those of House Squall and Glaciar, when the first northern kingdoms had been forming. The Squalls, already recognizing the wealth and prosperity they would be assured from the mines they had established at the foothills of the Dragon Scale Mountains, refused to let this upstart group hold court and bargain for equal footing in their settlement. The Arafos and their followers had been sealed in one of the deep mine shafts after bitter fighting and left to starve. No one could have foreseen they would find underground passages to the west and survive the trek across the Bowl of Storms to become a great house dedicated to repaying the acts of the squalls for all eternity. Yes, Kermon would have happily let the city burn and then rebuilt it using the majesty of dark ice that had been carved into the imposing fortress of Cold Crag, which dominated the skyline of Shearwater Cove. A whole metropolis made of the mystical material, a true testament to the greatness that the North, the North should have achieved, would have been Kermon's vision. Yet he was content with what he had done so far. The line of House Squall was severed. Greymane had fled and given his shameful actions before his imprisonment, he could never return to the north as anything but a prisoner. Greymane's father, Algathor, had died in Glaciar. Greymane's squall, Greymane's young, lone surviving daughter, had apparently tried to flee through the dragon scales to the Bull of Storms. Even if she managed to get past the mountains, she would never survive the harsh conditions of the frozen land. Kermon Arafos had finally achieved what his ancestors had attempted to accomplish since their inception. He had orchestrated the destruction of the hated squalls. And now he was in command of Nepal City, a th second in authority only to Wolfbane himself, and, if he were being honest, that unnerving wizard Deogron. But the mage was rarely at court and hardly a presence when he was. Cameron had taken to exploiting the authority which he was given and the indifference with which Wolfbane treated such, what must have been, to his mind, small matters. Cameron had sent his house carls to oversee Frothgar's interests for a price, of course. Thus his personal coffers had grown heavy even as the people of the city grew fearful and withdrawn. Wolfbane hardly seemed to notice. The so-called Napoleon resistance concerned him far more. Having taken up a fluid base of operations in the Whitewood, the resistance was a thorn to Wolfbane's side. While Nepal City had been culled through the use of force and political machination, the other house, northern houses had proved more stubborn than the leader of the Narathians had expected. What Kermon, a man Wolfbane knew to be driven almost solely by a childish need for revenge, did in Nepal City was of no matter, as long as it remained under, complete, under his complete control. Kermon was certain he could exploit his new power to his heart's content as long as the city remained firmly in Wolfbane's grasp. Much to his own chagrin, Wolfbane was rarely able to leave Castle Bane, the title he had given to the former Nepal city castle from where he now reigned. 
Castlevane was a unique construction for a defensive fortification, given it was added to a previously walled city and not the other way around. During the unification of Nepal, Vlad Arconin, Thane of his house, had aligned with Varanus, the god of truth, and tried to conquer all of northern Lagotia. His gravest error was in choosing a god outside of those most revered in Nepal, turning his fellow northerners against him in substantial numbers. When Vladar was defeated, the Allied opposition concluded that perhaps having a singular high thane was not such a terrible idea, provided they were chosen from the ranks of more traditional Nepalians. Thus the young woman Anara Dolg became the first high thane, and many felt a true castle ought to be built for future holders of the title to reside in. Since the Dolgs already possessed a personal residence atop one of Nepal City's famed Four Hills, the terrain was deemed suitable for a more complex defensive structure. The Dolg Hall became the main keep, with dungeons and workshops honeycombed throughout the stony earthworks beneath, and a simple curtain wall and larger multi-story addition to the hall added later. This had included some unusual modifications at later dates, such as the unnecessarily tall spire in the northwestern corner of the keep, where Wolfbane kept his personal quarters, and whose designer, Kundrin Dolg, had earned the title of the Mad Thane for demanding the oddity to be built for him personally. From a military standpoint, Wolfbane recognized that Castlevane was a perfectly serviceable fort with the surrounding and mighty city wall, making it a, as practical a seat of defensive authority as it was a political symbol for his adherence to the customs of the North. And yet, even as he respected the value of it, he hated the place. Castlevane and Nepal in general had begun to feel like a prison to the warrior from the West. Wolfbane would have been far happier leading his forces to the South, Still, some measure of deference for his position as ruler in the north had to be made, and the great man was currently seated on the throne of the High Thane, hearing the reports of the merchants and nobility still active within the city, as well as those complaints of the few citizenry brave enough to step forward and make them. As his lone native-born advisor, Kermon Arafas stood by his side and provided input on each speaker, along with his thoughts on Wolfbane's potential courses of action. The man from the west could not, and in truth did not wish to, hide his utter boredom and disinterest with the proceedings. Like most government meetings Wolfbane had attended, these sessions were full of false bowing and scraping to appeal to his ego and petty or impossible to address concerns. Wolfbane had little use for such audacious wastes of his time. He leaned his head on one massive hand, slouched on the throne of the high thanes with his legs spread languidly wide, half listening to each visitor. Caron would lean in and give his input from time to time, which was the only point when Wolfbane would actively pay attention. The last emissary from a great house, Wolran Kaldegar's youngest daughter, Finish her account of trade and exchange within the city. Wolfbane barely caught reference to violence and theft, waving Caramon away before he could speak and saying, I'll see to it the streets are made safer within the week. The finances of the nation must be kept in order. There was no intonation of dismissal, and a brief pause marked by uncomfortable silence fell before the young woman realized she was to leave. She curtsied slightly and walked up quickly from the hall. Behind her came a small group of simply dressed men and women. Caramon eyed them from a distance and scowled, leaning down to Wolfbane's right ear. Peasants from outside the walls, my lord. I doubt this is worthy of your concern. I apologize. I thought my guards had made it clear the common folk were not to disrupt you with unnecessary problems. Wolfbane did not respond. Something in the eyes of the man in the lead, an older figure in worn leather work attire and leaning on a thick walking stick, made him sit up and pay attention. As they reached the foot of the dais, Wolfbane extended his hand as in a gesture of reception to a valued guest and said, Tell me, old man, what brings you and so many of your folk here? My dread lord, the man's voice was quavering in fear, but Wolfbane could sense something worse than his barbaric presence had made it so. We would not wish to trouble you with our plight, but an unspeakable horror has been visited upon my family. Wolfbane nodded slightly at him to continue, his hand now rubbing his thick beard in thought and interest. A beast of the dark has been attacking our farms near the edge of the Whitewood, killing goats and men alike. We set traps, put out our fiercest dogs to defend us, and armed ourselves against the threat, but the monster has outwitted every attempt and slain over twenty young men and women, including my three-year-old grandson. The man's voice was cracking as he spoke, the emotion boiling over in the moment. Wolfbane held up his hand without even glancing at Caramon to silence the interruption he knew must be coming. Leaning forward, the leader of the invading Narathians asked, When did these attacks begin? A month ago, my lord. So the creature has killed almost every night, and has anyone seen the beast? Do you know anything of it? At that, the crowd fell quiet, and a small figure was pushed and guided to the front. The old man stood to one side so Wolfbane could see the figure clearly, and the commander was surprised enough to lower his hand from his chin and sit up at attention. The young boy, perhaps eight or nine years, was missing his left ear and eye, a trio of brutal scars stretching from the top of his forehead down to beneath his jaw. The old man held his hand at the child's back to support him. This is Grayson. He's the only victim to have lived to see the thing that haunts us. He survived only because his eldest sister attacked the beast and was savagely, savagely butchered, by it while giving him time to flee. 
Wolfbane said nothing but stood and stepped down from the dais, looming like a mountain over the boy. He looked down at him and said, Tell me what you saw. My lord, the boy's voice shook, but he did not falter. It was like a monstrous blackened mountain, with a back of spears and claws like swords. When it came at me, it broke through fences and heavy fallen trees like they were leaves of grass. Idra, he did not stop then, brief, he did stop then, briefly, as he thought of his sister. She dove at it with her spear, and the thing reared up, taller even than you, my lord, and cut her to pieces in one swipe. The boy made as though to continue, but the words would not come, tears leaking from his remaining eye, and, red with what Wolfbane assumed must be blood, from the patched socket where his left eye had once been. Caramon was behind the commander inside. He could send some men to deal with this. It's likely a bear that's not hibernating and has gone mad in search of food. These things happen in the north. Yes, my lord, the old man agreed, but what has been happening is unlike anything I've ever seen. Caramon glared ferociously at the leader of the envoy. Old as you are, peasant, I doubt you have seen every iteration of feral bears that have crawled out of the Whitewood. Caramon turned to Wolfbane. I'll send a dozen men with spears and bows today. They'll have this sorted out in short order. Wolfbane appeared not to hear. He knelt before the boy and said to the elder, How far is your farmstead from the city? Perhaps half a day's ride, my lord? Wolfbane said nothing, nor did anything at first. Then nodding to himself, he stood and walked past the throne, heading for the stairs leading to his personal chambers high at the top of the great spire of Nepal City Castle. Caramon, have my horse saddled and gather a number of your men. We will settle this for these people tonight. The thane of House Erephos was agog, unsure how to respond and unable to move, standing in stunned silence. He watched his leader disappear out of the hall and turned to the unwanted guests. He scowled fearsomely and waved a hand in frustration. Go then, we will meet you outside the east gate within the hour. Stunned but sensing there was hope, the small band turned and shuffled sharply out of the main hall of the castle. Cameron watched them go in disgust, then turned to one of his men stationed along the wall of the Grand Hall. You heard Lord Wolfbane. Go and get your horses ready, and saddle one yourself as well as five more for your fellows. It looks like we'll be hunting a bear this evening. Chance to adjust. A bitter and frustrated Caramon Arafos sat atop his grey mottled horse outside the east gate of Nepal City, waiting for Wolfbane's arrival. Dressed in his yellow and brown cloak and other fiery, which would have made more traditional Napoleon snicker, he cursed the cold. The thing was displeased the entire expedition, not just because of the danger it posed to him and the man who had, he had sworn allegiance to, but because it was a waste of time on the part of them both. This was a matter to be delegated to those not in power, and for some reason, Wolfbane had decided to see to it himself. A rickety cart, laden down with the small group of farmers who had come to plead for aid, waited some distance down the road. Caramon had made it clear he wanted nothing to do with them or their troubles, and they seemed content to keep clear of him and his men. The thane of House Erephos watched his breath form cloud after cloud in the frigid air, and tried not to think of how much frostier the weather would be after midday. Wolfbane came riding out of the gate then, alone. He was clad in a mass of fur with his signature wolf's head atop his own. The black and brown skins of several beasts were, not, were only just enough to cover his massive form, and he looked not like a giant bear himself. His chest was bare with a single leather strap across it to hold his battle axe, and a long, thick fur kilt covering his legs that ended in high leather boots. The man from the west rode steadily past Caramon without a word and up to the cart, where the old man sat on the bench beside a younger woman. Wolfbane was still taller than them both on his unnaturally large horse, and given his own immense size. He stared downward and said, Lead on. We will follow. The old man snapped the reins, and the horses began a steady trot away from the city. Caramon sighed and led his men forward, sending them to protect the sides of the cart and riding at the rear with Wolfbane. They moved steadily for several hours, the rhythmic bounce of the horses and chilling stillness of the air contradicting one another as they rode on. The old man drove the cart at a decent pace, perhaps concerned that if he did not reach his farmstead swiftly enough, the leader of the invaders would change his mind. Wolfbane said nothing to Caramon. Indeed, he had hardly looked up from the road as they headed north and east towards the very beginnings of the forest known as the Whitewood. The northern lands are home to many trades, from logging and fur trapping to fishing, hunting, and farming. The Whitewood, a massive and thick forest mixing, mixing evergreen and deciduous trees, supplies a significant quantity of the resources that support the Napoleon economy. At the same time, the Whitewood is a fearful place. Most will not go deep, too deep into the undergrowth, and farms like the one Wolfbane and his band were now traveling towards that brushed up against the edge of the forest dealt with the constant threat of animal attack. Other, darker rumors of spirits in the Whitewood, remnants of the followers of Nathran Emberstone from during the Age of Faith, kept most from daring to go beneath the thickest canopy. Who knew what might lurk a day's march into the thick trunks of the Whitewood's trees? It was as they were reaching the very outskirts of the meager farms that Wolfbane, still without looking towards Caramon, addressed his fellow rider. 
How much has your income grown from siphoning off Frothgar's illegal activities? Kermon was stunned and unable to respond at first, though he tried to recover. I don't know what you're talking about, Lord Wolfbane. I've been attempting to rectify some of the crimes reinvigorated by Thane Conan within the Paul City. Hi, Thane Conan, Wolfbane corrected him. Did I ever tell you how I got my name? No, Kermon responded cautiously. I must admit I have heard only rumors of your legend. Wolfbane ignored the obvious attempt to flatter him and said, I was newly departed from the Syrian peninsula, where I had worked for Lord Christian Tyrain. His daughter Vera, married to some soft, whining nobleman, had found me more to her liking. I did not hide our affair. It seemed obvious she would choose someone more cunning and capable than the man she'd married out of necessity. But in the Lion Empire, appearances matter more than practicality or good sense. Tyrain sent legionaries after me and my men, but the fool had paid me a king's ransom to be his muscle in the region and increase his hold on trade there. I was able to bribe and fight my way north to Girthen's Pass. Have you heard of it? Caramon was nervous, unsure where this odd jaunt into Wolfane's Pass was going. No, my lord, I can't say that I have. It's a sizable town, once called Coldwater, I believe, near the kingdom of the Evanlar Elves. That is where I met the Blood Wolf Mercenary Company. They ran the town and were in control of every single thing within it, including every last man, woman, and child. They were led by some pompous, overdressed fool named Rizben Kuloth. He styled himself like some sort of vagabond nobleman, but he was too stupid to hold power for long. He tried to have a seize when we reached the town. I cut his head from his shoulders while he was still in the saddle. That tale is one I think I've heard. That was how I got my name, Wolf's Bane, which in time became Wolf Bane. It tur I turned that mercenary group into an elite fighting force and set out for it last, before meeting the god of death and coming to his service. I weeded out every last one of the men and women in the Blood Wolves, stupid or gullible enough to remain loyal to a Risbin but I did it sensibly. I sent them on forays to kill the other dangerous criminals the Blood Wolves had let rise to power in Girthen's Pass, and if that failed, I challenged their best fighters in single combat to prove my superiority. In short, I carved out the disease within the Blood Wolves and formed a band of followers of great skill and greater loyalty. Caramon cleared his throat and said, The quality of your men has been clear since your arrival, my lord. I have no doubt they modeled themselves after your own excellence. Perhaps, Wolfbane replied, but it isn't their quality as fighters or even men that matters. It's their deference. They will do precisely what they are asked when they are asked, or they know they will meet their fate, the same fate of the man that gave me my name. You, Cameron Arafos, are not cut of that same cloth. Cameron tensed them, wondering what he would do when Wolfbane inevitably struck at him for his dishonesty and criminal action within Nepal City, but there was no blow forthcoming. Wolfbane instead turned his fearsome countenance on the other man. Frothgar may act in ways I find detestable, and he is a man most enamored with vices and sins, but he is unendingly useful to me as the High Thane and my spymaster. You are too inept at both. However, your line has been one of the great warriors and commanders in the past, and you display some skill in those matters yourself. The Blood Wolves will take over policing duties within Nepal City after today, and you and your men will take up authority in Glaciar and root out this Nepalian resistance. Serve me well in that, and I will forget your bumbling actions of the past months in the capital. Kermon did not answer, completely taken aback by the shrewdness of his commander and unnerved by the dark tone in his words. Eventually, he simply bowed his head in acceptance and turned his eyes back towards the road. Wolfbane did not say anything more as they trotted onward, but perhaps brought out of his cling of clinging fear by the shock of not having been killed for his, as Wolfbane had called it, bumbling, Kermon ventured to ask the question that had been gnawing at him. My lord, I must know, why are we seeing to this matter personally? I admit that I was dismissive of these farmers and their problem, but it still seems a matter that could be handled by our men rather than taking the risk ourselves. You are right, Wolfbane said. It could be handled by others, but the man had a look of someone who had been utterly shattered by whatever is threatening his home, and it would do us some good to complete a task that meets with the approval of the Northerners. There are pockets of rebellion even outside the resistance in Whitewood. I've heard rumblings in low winter among the Thanes and their house carls. They do not have the forces to sustain a breaking off of our confederation. But with the bulk of the army to the south, there could be a disruption to the pace of our mission. So you intend to solve this matter and present it as a sign of our commitment to the people, in order to undermine the complaints to the east. Despite himself, Kermon was once again impressed by Wolfbane's in intricate and insightful mind. Should I dis also dispatch some house carls to Low Winter to sort out the extent of the treachery? No, Wolfbane answered. I've already sent Deavron to solve that matter. He is ensconced in Marl Paz most of the time and much closer to the issue. Besides, he has servants that can be more discreet and deadly if it comes to that. Cameron did not answer, but he could not suppress a shudder at the thought of who or what those servants might be. He rubbed his chin, wrapped in the thick, dark facial hair about his mouth, and pondered. Wolfbane did not give him long, adding almost as an afterthought. 
And beyond the mere appearance of concern for the common people, I do wish to do some good in this place. Our methods have been harsh by necessity. No Napoleon would ever bend their knee willingly to our cause. They are a proud people, and their history with zealous men bringing the word of the gods, especially those not considered Napoleon gods, is one rife with conflict. The Napoleons, your people, had to be brought to heel, but in the end the Congress should leave this land better than it was before. Caremont could detect a hint of doubt in Wolfbane's words. He had often heard him say similar things about the true goals of the invaders. They had come from the north, the feat believed to have been impossible, and swept down from the frozen reach to take all of the Napoleon Empire in short order. It had been done meticulously, with careful research and inroads to disgruntled parties, and ultimately led to the power that now possessed, now possessed by the Narathian forces. Yet Caremont had seen the brutality of the conquest for what it was. He cared not, since he barely considered himself and his people of the same stock as the rest of the north and was sure the other houses felt the same way about his line. War and death were necess necessary, and if Wolfbane wanted to believe that he was undertaking a grand crusade so he could sleep at night, then Caremont was willing to let him. Besides, he had just learned how dangerous trying to deceive the other man could be. The cart began to slow up ahead of Wolfbane and Caremont and turned down a path worn by dual wheel tracks running perpendicular through the packed snow. The horses and their riders were all so slowed as they came off the wider road and began trudging through the remnants of the last few snowfalls, hard and compacted from the unending winter chill. In the distance, a long, low farm could be seen with lengthy stretches of fences extending out from it, ending at the first thickening of the white wood. Cameron could not see into the depths of the forest, dense and distant as it was, and he turned his eyes on the residence. It was a clay and thatched home with no windows, smoke coming from a hole on the right side of the structure. He imagined the inside was one large room with poorly made furniture strewn about and shuttered. The Thane of House Arafos hoped they would settle this matter soon and he could be on his way to Glaciar, where the houses were at least mildly more civilized. As they reached the home, two figures came out of it, both women, perhaps teenagers, and clearly shocked at the appearance of the riders. They nearly fainted when Caremont announced himself in Wolfbane, but the old farmer managed to calm them and welcomed his esteemed guests inside. Wolfbane entered first, leaving the soldiers Caremont had brought to feed and water their mounts. The Thane of Arafos came in and was displeased to be proven right in his estimation of the state of the home. The room was lit by a bright, flickering fire and had little within it more than straw mats and a meager set of benches and a table. Wolfbane did not seat himself, but gestured for the farmer to take his place at the table. Can you show me where we will find this beast? I would like to return to Nepal City tonight, if I can. Of course, my lord, the man answered. He beckoned the young boy who had survived the creature's assault over and placed his hand on his shoulder. Grayson knows the way, and his elder brother can accompany you. He's fairly skilled with the bow. If you wish... Wolfbane answered, pulling his massive axe free and running his fingers along the keen edge, though I doubt he'll have much chance to use his weapon if I see the monster first. That seemed to settle the matter, and there was nothing to be done then except to march to the woods. Three of Caramon's troop came with them, along with the young Grayson and his brother. Wolfbane followed the boy at his heels, posing quiet questions as they walked that Caramon could not hear from his position near the back. He had no intention of getting himself near enough to be harmed by the bear, but he had a, his blade pulled free and brandished so as to look ready for a fight. The walk was not a difficult one, but the sun was going down early, given the onset of winter, and the elder of the two boys expressed concerns about hunting their foe when it was darkening. Wolfbane calmed him by promising to turn back if they caught no trace of the beast when the light began to fail, but then they were in a, at a thick and imposing rock near the tree line, and Grayson pointed with a wavering finger at it. Caramon, despite his misgivings, came forward to see what was on the stone, and noted splashes of dark, dried flakes. Wolfbane knelt in the snow and studied them, running one hand on the rock and looking at the ground and trees about him. He pointed to one trunk a few feet away, marred by deep gouges in the bark, and Caramon followed his finger. The chunks of wood ripped free had to have been about a foot in length and many inches thick. Wolfbane approached the tree. Caramon saw that the claws had, dug, had the claws dug any deeper, the entire thing might have come toppling down. Wolfbane ran his free hand over the gouges and sniffed it. There is still some sap leaking from the wood. This is not so old a mark. When were you attacked, boy? Five days ago, my lord. Then someone else was out here since and met the monster. Our eldest brother, the other boy said. He came out a few days ago to look for signs of our sister. Wolfbane peered around the thick trunk of the tree and paused as his eyes caught something. He turned away and began walking back towards the two boys. I think he found more than he would have liked. We should get you both back to your home. Caramon, despite himself, stepped forward and gazed around the expanse of the marred tree to see what Wolfbane had spotted. There was a wide swath of red in the snow as though someone had dumped crimson paint on it but he could see in the scarlet mounds of, of something that he recognized a boot with part of the leg still sticking out. He turned away sharply and began walking back towards Wolfbane. The Narathian leader was facing the farmhouse, but his head was turned towards the woods as though he sensed something. Suddenly he spun and walked back towards the trees, stopped, 
and Cameron heard him urinating against the base of a tree that had been clawed. As Wolfbane walked past him, having relieved himself fully, Caramon asked, somewhat tersely, Could you not have waited till we got a safe distance away to do that? No, Wolfbane replied without slowing his pace. I wanted to mark the thing's territory so it would come looking for me. I'm afraid we won't be going back to Nepal City tonight. We'll be waiting for a guest at our new lodgings this evening. Caramon opened his mouth to express his infuriation at being made unwilling bait, but then thought the better of it and stormed after the commander, gesturing angrily to his men to follow him as well. The sun was already halfway behind the trees, and it would be dark soon. So that's chapter one. I am going to read part of chapter two. I'm just going to figure out exactly how far we'll go based on the time. Yeah, so I think we're going to go a couple more pages here. <clears throat> In western South Ron, there is only the sun, the heat, and the sand. Some things grow from the barren, cracked earth, but they are mostly small plants with sharp spines that secrete deadly poisons. The wisest nomads can get past their spiked defenses to the precious stores of water, but any man or woman not native to the region and privy to her secrets will die in the attempt. Their corpses feed the small animals that burrow beneath the sand for protection from the sun and wind, the only creatures able to live longer than a few days in the deserts of the east. It was through this inhospitable land that Rath ib Athor Ein Elman led his foreign companions. The malarian never shed his dark, all-encompassing garb, even when the heat was so severe that a hazy vision crept over all the travelers. Wrath never wavered and never rested. The watcher from Ulanar would allow his fellows, followers respite only when he felt they must rest, but he tried to push the refugees of Delmore and their saviors onward. The endless sands had been his home all his life, and Wrath knew that if they stopped for too long, they would eventually be incapable of starting once more. Bare-chested in his normally white skin, now a light brown from the sun, Logan tried to keep himself moving along all his, among all his charges, doing his best to lead by example as he offered encouragement and prodded them onward. From the passage of Kronikarl, they had followed Wrath south and slightly west, trusting his oath to lead them to the safety of his homeland, to Ulanar, the crown jewel of the dominion of the Malarians, which some foreigners called the Sun People. They were a mysterious society, those who had built small towns, even a populous city, out of the emptiness of this desert. Logan believed less and less each day that such a thing was even possible. The very air seemed to actively work against he and his allies, choking the breath in their lungs with heat and fine grains of sand. For three days they had marched in the heat, huddling together when the night came, and the temperature dropped so sharply that it stole the breath from them within seconds of the darkness coming on. Five of the wounded and infirm had died already, and Logan feared many more would perish if they did not find shelter soon. They had left the bodies unburied at Rath's insistence, one born from the creed of his people and the practicality of not wasting energy digging graves. Logan wasn't sure a hole could even be made in the shifting sand or the hardened deep beneath it. The journey had begun much, with much more promise. In the plains and thin woods near the mountains, there had been game and water to keep them supplied. Wrath had pressed Logan the urgency of, upon Logan the urgency of rationing food and water for later, and the knight was glad he had listened. They still had enough of both for another week or more, but nothing could combat the way nature was conspiring against them now. The black-clad guide had insisted they were close to a small oasis, a place where they could find respite from the oppressive land about them. Logan hoped he was right. He could not bear the deaths of any more people, those he had promised to protect, not to mention many that he had come to regard as his friends. Diaga, not as frail as he had been when they first left Gaila Kill, had fared better than Logan expected, but he was worn down now from the extreme climate and caring for Treb. The half-elf was still unconscious and horribly scarred from his encounter with Balthazane beneath the grim rise of the Sun-Teeth Mountains. Neither Diaga nor Kaliandra could heal him completely, his wounds being too extreme and terrible to be mended by their magic. Wrath had promised help from his people, gifted in many things arcane and mysterious, but Diago was still fighting to keep the half-elf alive until then. Caliandra had added the strength for faith and service to Endoth, but she was also attempting to keep the young children, Samuel Jovian and Nawandel, sustained as well. Such disparate efforts had sapped much of her formerly optimistic spirit. The rest simply pushed on because there was nothing else to be done. Javandaleth resembled a sleepwalker as he put one foot in front of the other determinedly, trying to move ahead just one more step, then another, and another. Ghost had been caring for him gruffly, yet with obvious concern, until his own fatigue caught up with him. The two were mirror images now, plodding stoically onward with only their will to go on, driving them. The only members of the companions unfazed by wounds or weather were Neep and Grimtooth. The orc was so hardy that the heat seemed not to touch him, and as he unwaveringly hauled Trem, along with a hodgepodge of armor and weapons on a sled made with a few branches they'd found at the edge of the sands. For her part, Neep seemed almost enhanced by the heat, moving swiftly and unendingly about the company, acting as scout, and first warning of any danger, though blessedly there had been no trouble yet. Of course, Logan expected their fortune to turn in that respect as well. Nothing was going well, why should it get, not get worse? 
Grimtooth stamped beside his blood brother with Trem's sled behind him. Diago walked alongside the makeshift gurney, his only concession to the heat the open chest of his robe. Where Logan's skin had darkened in the sun, Diago's had burnt brightly and painfully red, only recently peeling and adopting a slightly tanned tone. Logan turned to the powerful orc, wiping his own forehead. We cannot be far now, either from our salvation or our doom. Grimtooth shrugged. I didn't worry much about doom and gloom, Logan. We ought to be dead for long on this path. That sounds a lot like gloom to me, brother. The orc shook his head. Nay, just accepting that the road we be on leads to death. Tis nothing to fear. It just be the way things are. Do you regret our choice? Nay, a bit. Tis what we be meant for. Logan seemed to accept the submission of Grimtooth to such dark thoughts. Diago left Trim's side a moment to join the two at the front of the great mass of humanity behind them. The young man glanced over his shoulder as he rubbed his now scraggly hair with a free hand, the other holding his staff to aid his every step. They're fading, Logan. They trust you, but they're starting to believe we've gone astray. We may have, Logan grunted. No reason for Ath to drag us into the desert to die when he could have killed us in our sleep a hundred times over, but I do wonder where he's taking us and how much longer he expects us to last. Not much longer, Knight. Rat's voice flowed eerily from over Logan's right shoulder. Those with us will make it if we can but cross the next line of dunes. The oasis lies past them, and there you will find the rest I promised you. Removing his hood, Rath turned his shaven head to look at Trem as he addressed Diaga. He yet lives? The wizard nodded confidently. Yes, but I do not know when or even if he will wake up. He will, Rath said softly. Of that I am quite certain. Trem felt the cold stone beneath him chilling his bones and resting him from his fitful slumber. He sat up sharply and immediately regretted it as he swooned and slumped backwards, his head spinning. Closing his eyes, he concentrated on his other senses, the musty, aged smell of the room, the gentle touch of thin cloth against his waist and legs, and the crashing noise of complete silence. His eyes opened slowly and he propped himself up on his elbows. He was naked, covered in a thin gray shroud that hung across his waist and down to the stone floor beneath him. With extreme care, he sat up, pulling the cloth about his hips as he studied the room. It was a tomb, an ancient one bedecked in murals and carvings he did not recognize. He eased himself forward, thinking to get his feet and, on his feet and investigate further. I would not try that, Trem. Not yet. The Hathos head snapped to his left, the tomb's entrance, where Narath, clad in a fine black robe with silver trim, leaned against the frame of a sealed stone door. My son played rather roughly with you, and I fear he's left you weakened, even here in the world of dreams. The half elf looked at the god of death coldly before replying, I have learned that I cannot be certain who visits me in this place. You may be Neroth, or you may be Balthazane in disguise once more. Neroth laughed softly. If he meant to put you at ease, why would my son choose my form? His head still aching, Trem winced and muttered, I don't pretend to know. I thought your kind was limited in your ability to manipulate me here, yet you keep encroaching on my dreams. You are weak. Your defenses are hardly present. Trem contemplated trying to manipulate this portion of the dreamscape as he had when Balthazane had sought him out after nearly killing him in Sunhall, but he was weak and he suspected that Neroth would be far more difficult to drive off than his progeny. Instead, he decided to talk, since it seemed to be all his adversary was interested in. If you truly are the god of death, then tell me what you want. Want? Neroth seemed genuinely confused by the idea. You know what I want. You've known for a long time. But in this moment, why seek me out? It seems you wanted to kill me. If you wanted to kill me, you could, so why are we talking? Neroth sighed and stepped from the entrance, spreading his arms. It's the same as it has ever been, Trem. I want you to see the bigger picture. You tried to kill me. Balthazane tried to kill you, not I. He's your son. Trem could not contain his anger any longer, lurching to his feet. You mean to tell me he does not represent your will? Trem stumbled as a wave of dizziness washed over him, obscuring his vision. Before he could recover, he fell forward in his sudden frailty, pulling him downward. But the floor did not rise up to meet him. Neroth had rushed in silently, catching Trem in his cold hands before he struck the ground. I told you that you were too weak. The immortal whispered softly in his ear. Too weak and too rash to know when to stay still. Trem raised his head with some effort to meet Neroth's dark eyes. Balthazane has his reasons for hating you, and most mortals. When you reach Ulinar, you could inquire why he feels as he does. Ulinar? That's where you're going. It's the only reason to have braved the passage of Kronikarl in the Endless Sands. Neroth steadied Trem, making certain he could stand on his own, before stepping back to give him some space. In Ulinar, you can learn much, if you're willing to ask the correct questions. Seek out the temples. Talk to me and the other gods, and then we can see what you've learned. Trim did not have a chance to reply as the room about him winked out of existence, and he felt himself falling suddenly into limitless space and time. Let's see how long the next section is. All right, we'll do one more section. 
Trim's eyes snapped open, and the area about him was not the horrid emptiness he had felt all around only moments before. He could instead feel his body swaying, shifting as it moved slightly and methodically onward. Trim smelled the dry heat of the air around him and squinted to make out the sinking sun in the distance that, despite its gradual fall, still shone brightly upon his face. The litter he was attached to held him snugly, and he could not move, nor was he certain he could speak. He saw the massive, light green bulk of Grimtooth's back and shoulders moving doggedly before him, somewhat darker in color than he remembered, hauling the sled Trim was strapped to across the sand dune, sand-covered dunes to a destination he knew nothing of. Trim tried to sit up and felt a wrenching pain through his legs that lanced across his whole body so suddenly and viciously that he let out an audible gasp of shock. This brought the marching orc to a sudden halt, and he glanced over his shoulder, eyes widening when he saw Trim was awake. He spun back and bellowed, "Ye be awake, lads. Javetta left. Diago. Jovan was the first to reach the litter, kneeling down with a look of real concern at Trem's grimacing face. Water, Trem rasped, please, and the mage's touch if possible. Diago was already there along with Ghost, who wordlessly opened his near-empty near canteen and poured a few drops onto Trem's tongue. The mage knelt and undid several of the bonds that held the half up to the sled and looked at them. How severe is the pain? Trem did not answer, merely swallowed and winced as that action also lanced pangs of agony across his body. Diago nodded as though that was enough and stood waving his hand to another approaching figure. I can try to alleviate the pain, but it would be less effective than Caliandra's fate. As if on cue, the young woman in her fluttering white robes was beside the litter, brushing her dark hair from her face. Without looking at the wizard, she asked Diaga, What do you want me to do? He's in pain. Can you lessen it without sending him back to sleep? Looking at Trem, Diaga explained, I'm afraid too much exertion, and you might not wake up again. Trem simply nodded, and Caliandra placed her hands on his face, closing her eyes in prayer. There was nothing other than a strange sensation of calm, and then the pain ceased to overwhelm him. It was still present, throbbing in the background of Trem's consciousness, but he at least felt half alive. Thank you. Logan appeared next to his blood brother then, along with Rath. The black-clad figure looked meaningfully at the knight, and Logan waved him forward with a hand. As Rath swept to the front of the caravan of refugees, the Anglodaic turned to his companions. I'm glad you are awake, Trem, but we must keep moving. Rath says we're nearly there, and if we stop for too long, I fear we won't reach our destination. I'll stay with him, Javanna West spoke up, and keep an eye on him. Logan nodded in agreement, and Grimtooth shouldered the ropes of the sled again as they continued onward. Diaga and Caliandra looked to Trem over once more, then made their way forward as well. Javanna West walked alongside the litter in silence, keeping half an eye on Trem, who tried to sit up but eventually slumped backwards, unable to keep himself propped on one elbow for long. The line of travelers plodded forward for over an hour, and still neither said a word. Finally, Trem broke the silence. I can't feel anything but pain in my legs. Joanna looked down at his companion and sighed. When Wrath got to you, it seems Gen had already done significant damage. Diaga and Caliandra tried to heal your wounds, but they were deep and severe. Wrath thinks his people, the Malarians, can help. We're heading for the city of Ulanar now. The explanation caused Trem to remember the sinister betrayal of the halfling saw Wrath again. Trem never, should never have trusted him, and it had nearly killed everyone in their party and the refugees besides. Trim tried to move his legs within the binds of the ropes about them and gasped loudly as another shock of severe pain raced up his body. The broken man looked up at the concerned eyes of Trevanaleth. It seems I might not be much use to you anymore, Joven. The principal aid hunk shook his head emphatically. We just need to find a better healer than Diaga or Caliandra. Things will get better in Ulanar. Trim did not answer, laying back on the sled and closing his eyes. A few moments later, he felt a great shift of sand beneath him and forced himself to sit up with some effort. Javanaleth and Grimtooth were walking beside one another in the distance. Trem could see the line of refugees climbing downward from vast sandy height to a small but notably green section of what seemed impossibly to be foliage below. Sure enough, there were low bushes, cacti, and even the small palm trees about a murky, pond-sized body of water. Joven glanced back and saw Trem scanning the distance. It's the oasis Rat has been leading us to. There should be food and water there. It looks like we made it. How did we come to be in this infernal place? Javanaleth slowed to match the pace of Trem's litter. You remember the city Ghost is seeking, Ulanar. Apparently Wrath is from there. His people built a metropolis somewhere out in this desert, but I cannot for the life of me understand how it's possible. Still, he promised us a place to rest and recuperate, and it appears he was speaking the truth. After what he's done for me, I believe I could at least extend him some measure of trust. Jovan's face expressed real doubts. You should know, Trem, that Wrath admitted he was sent to stop us, specifically you, from coming to Southron. He was ordered to kill you. That's how he ended up in league with Gend. Apparently some very powerful leaders in Ulanar sent him to end your life, and I still do not entirely understand why he chose to save you instead. Trem collapsed back under the beaten sled with a sigh. As long as he gets me something to drink, I choose not to worry about his motivations, at least tonight. Jovan was about to correct Trem as to the time of day when he glanced about and realized that the seemingly unending sun was indeed setting at last. 
Wrath was moving fleetly across the sand, whispering encouragement to the travelers, who were somehow still dragging themselves over the desert. He paused when he reached the litter and put a hand on Javanaleth's shoulder. Hurry, young warrior. When the sun falls, we must not be in the open. Javanaleth was about to question why they needed to be out of the open when he felt a sharp cut of cold wind across the sand. The heat was so intense here he often forgot how equally frigid the nights could be. Pulling his cloak about him, he grasped one of the ropes Grimtooth was hauling across a meaty shoulder and began pulling beside him. The orc snorted and muttered to himself, Of course, soon as we get near where we'll be going, the lad decides to be useful. The line of refugees and their would-be saviors reached the oasis before the sun fully dropped below the horizon, but the cold had already become fairly severe. The area about the pond was lined with small bushy plants interspersed with young but hardy-looking trees stretching out over the water with large, heavy fronds. About the brown, dirty liquid, there were several stone shelters with roughly patched holes filled with dried palm and fronds and sticks. Rath hopped up onto a rock before the water and gestured to the hovels. You can find shelter from the wind there, though burn no fires. We do not want to attract attention. You may fill your canteens if you need. Logan ushered more of the refugees forward, helping to carry some of the old and young to shelter before distributing rations with the aid of Diaga and Ghost. Grimtooth pulled Trem to a large stone shelter before finally shedding the ropes, revealing callous skin across his shoulders and chest from the burns of the rope pulled with great strain in the past few days. Trem thanked him, but the orc waved his words away with a casual gesture of one hand and went to fetch them water. Wrath came in and settled by Trem silently in a cross-legged fashion, watching the entrance. Logan and Ghost filed in just as Javanaleth and Grimtooth returned with water, distributing it among the group as they sat on the rough floor with a few scattered, or on a few scattered boulders. Logan looked at Ghost questioningly. Where's Diaga? The grizzled Napoleon snorted loudly, seeing to his charges in that cat of his, I suppose. I'm not his babysitter, Knight. Logan ignored the tone and turned his eyes to Wrath. Well, we made it to the oasis as he promised. Thank you. You are welcome, Knight. The assassin shifted slightly and examined the room. We should rest here. Tomorrow things will be different. Ghost leaned forward, his body already tensing for trouble. What do you mean, different? Wrath fixed his gaze on the older man. My brethren have followed us for some time. As long as we abide by the rules of this place, lighting no fires and not disturbing the life around the sacred water, they will leave us until the morning. And what then? Logan asked. Then, Wrath took a swig of water, they will come to see what we are here for, and if they do not approve, they will deal with us as they deem necessary. Will they try to harm us? Jovan asked. Wrath shifted again, and if Trem had not known better, he would have thought the dark-robed man was nervous. Not you, Prince of Blades. But if they find my reason for leading you here in violation of our creed, I will certainly be punished severely. There was a moment of silence before Logan spoke. Wrath, have you brought us somewhere you were not supposed to? Have you placed yourself in danger? Yes and no. Wrath undid his head wrap, revealing his dark skin and stunningly sharp eyes. By not completing my task and preventing the half-elf from coming to Southron, I have already violated the laws of my order. Bringing you here would be an affront to our code, but I have already broken it in one way, and therefore it is of little consequence to do so again and in such comparatively small fashion. That, Trem spoke from his prone position on the litter, suggests you may suffer a great deal on behalf of people that, for one reason or another, were supposed to be your enemies. Enemies is a strong term, Rath said contemplatively. The wisest in Ulinar chose to send me to end your life, but it was a hotly debated decision. Many felt that, regardless of whether you were destined to bring about our city's destruction, we should not interfere with fate. Those who eventually won the argument were equally passionate and perhaps frightened. Justifiably, Ghost said sternly. When the others looked at him, he rolled his eyes. You mean to tell me that if you learned a man was destined to bring about your doom, you would not also try to prevent it from happening? Aye, Grimtooth admitted. It'd be more reasonable than I thought. It does not matter now. Trem, you will not be healed if I do not take you to you, Lenar. Only there are those who can undo what Balthazane wrought upon your body. But Wrath, Logan pressed, what's going to happen to you in the morning? What can we do to aid you? Wrath shrugged in a way that was oddly dismissive of his predicament. As I said, my brothers and sisters have been following us for some time. The Watchers will meet me tomorrow, shortly after first light, and we will talk. I will do my best to persuade them to deal justly with you. That's very gracious of you, Wrath, Logan said. But we should also be ready to defend you. Everyone here owes you an incredible debt. Your offer is kind, Knight, but you must not interfere, or else you place all your party in jeopardy. I must pay whatever price my kin asks, and you must allow it to happen. No one spoke after that. They sat quietly sipping water and gnawing on the few remaining rations they still had. Diaga appeared after a few moments and, perhaps sensing the mood, sat silently against the stone wall of the shelter. After a short while, Rath stood and brushed his robes down, replacing his head wrap carefully and wordlessly exiting the hovel. The others sat and chewed in silence until Diaga nearly collapsed onto Grimtooth's shoulder as he fell asleep, sitting up. Despite his protests, the maid was laid down near Tram by the orc, and quickly joined by Neep, curled up beside his exhausted form. The orc stood and stamped his boots. I can take the first watch. Logan nodded in acceptance. 
I'll relieve you in a few hours. Grimdew strode out with surprising stealth for such a massive figure. Giovanna left Logan and Ghost remained a while longer before the Napoleon excused himself and exited into the windswept night. The gust of frigid air howled outside as Jovan tried to settle down on a hard patch of ground near the mage. He could hear Trem's breathing had slowed and was now rhythmic, indicating the half-elf slept once again. Logan's voice came eerily from the entrance to the shelter, where he still sat upon a small boulder. Do you think Rat's people can truly heal it? Jovan was taken aback by the audible doubt in the normally stalwart knight's voice. I think, he said slowly, that if Rath says they can, then they can. Logan did not answer right away, but after a moment, he said, I was not the son who would grow to, up to be king one day, Javadaleth. I cannot imagine how much that has weighed upon you, being the heir to a throne. I understand war and battle, right and wrong, but I do not relish being a leader. You got us here, Logan. You held our small band and the refugees together. Rath got us here, Logan sighed. I know that I did what I could to hold everything together, but I was just blindly stumbling forward like everyone else. And now the man who saved us is in danger, and apparently there's nothing I can do to help him. I know I have to let Rath see this challenge through himself. I know only he truly understands the customs and expectations of conduct. But I still feel I should do something. Only I have no idea what. And truthfully, I just want to see the people of Delmore to safety and find a way to return to my own home. Joe did not know how to respond, so unusual was this moment of insecurity from the dependable Logan. He must have waited too long because Logan stood and walked wordlessly out into the wind. Javanileth lay there on the floor of the stone shelter, listening to the howling outside and thinking about his own home. All this had begun because he had gone looking for his father, and now here he was, a continent away, searching for so many things at once. A healer, shelter for hundreds of displaced victims of war, and a rumor of a weapon necessary to bring about one man's revenge, or maybe even his salvation. In his mind, Jovan believed Wrath would find a solution and be spared any punishment. But perhaps it was just his own need for optimism in light of the grim circumstances. Rather than dwell on the challenges still facing them, Jovan rolled onto one side and eventually drifted off to sleep. So that will be it for today. Uh, if you want, you can follow me on uh, Twitter at, at Legacy Chronicle, and you can always send questions, messages, etc. through Twitch or on Facebook. Uh, if you search for Legacy Chronicle on Facebook, I take book orders, t-shirt orders, all that stuff. Um, thank you for those who came in and listened. Thanks for the hosts, uh, for Miss Beezus and anyone else. Uh, and I hope to see everybody on Sunday at 3.